Yep. Okay. So we're going to get started um, on our decolonizing the future conversation. Um, and uh, for those coming in, join us, make yourselves comfortable. Um, as you can see, it's very intimate. Uh, what we'd like to do is have about uh, 30 minutes of conversation and then um, use the rest of our time um, in conversation with everybody in the room. So um, if you have questions and comments and um, yeah, just want to join in, it doesn't have to just be the two of us. So um, we'll stop at the 30 minute mark. Um, so I will kick off. Uh, welcome. I'm really excited that we have this uh, space in the conference to um, zoom in a little bit and dig into this issue of uh, decolonizing the future. Um, I'll introduce myself by saying I'm Alicia Bagat. I am the Futures Lead at Forum for the Future. We are a global uh, sustainability nonprofit uh, using futures tools and futures thinking um, for a more just and regenerative future. Um, I also uh, teach part-time at Parsons, and uh, since the pandemic, have been convening a group called the Diaspora Futures Collective, which is a um, sort of informal group of uh, BIPOC futurists who um, convene to talk about uh, how decolonizing work and um, several issues around that shows up in our futures work. So I'm really excited today uh, to be in conversation with Nnedi uh, Okorafor, doctor. Uh, and uh, I've been a big admirer of your work. And um, uh, I will let you introduce yourself before we get going. Sure. Hello. Hi, everyone. Ooh, I like the sound of my voice. It's nice. Um, so I'm Nnedi Okorafor. And and I think that, like, just to start off, I want to just talk about what it is that I do so that context is understood. So I write science fiction and fantasy, um, specifically what, what I have coined to be called African futurism and African jujuism. There's a whole definition behind both of those. And I, I actually have written an essay that defines both of those. And there's a reason why um, it, I, I differentiate what I do from Afrofuturism. So there's that. Uh, so I write both of those. I write novels. I write novellas. I've written short stories. I've also written comics. I've written for Marvel. I, I wrote uh, Black Panther, Long Live the King, um, Shuri, which is a Black Panther's little sister. I, I did a, a, a series on that um, and some other things. I've also done my own independent comics work, one called LaGuardia, which is, a, um, it's, which is a, a graphic novel that's very much about decolonizing. <laughs> it, goes, it ve goes very well with the, with the subject of this, of this panel. Um, I've also written a short memoir called Broken Places in Outer Spaces. Um, I have several of my works that are in development for TV and, and film as well. So those are the things, so those are the things that I do. Um, and if I talk more, then I'll just, just start getting into it. But yeah, that's what I do. That's what I do. I'll leave it at that. Um, so maybe let's let's kick off with the big question, um, which is kind of how um, decolonizing this concept. So is is everyone in the room familiar with the concept of decolonizing? Um, I will guess that maybe people have different definitions uh, of that. So would love to know kind of your definition and how it shows up in the work that you do. Um, and kind of, uh, I can I can share mine as well. Yes, I'll share mine. Uh, so so definitely in the spaces in which I work, which is kind of the realm of professional foresight and using futures with organizations, um, decolonizing the future has sort of been this movement that started to kind of look at. Um, structural power, specifically colonial legacies uh, and post-colonial legacies, and looking at um, basically uh, what models and mindsets that we're inheriting from those colonial legacies um, and how to kind of uh, challenge those assumptions, look at the structures within them, 
and then um, rebuild as needed. So an example of this would be looking at um, hierarchical models of power, uh, looking at models of consumption and overconsumption, and thinking about ways in which uh, people, before this sort of extractive settler colonialism ideology uh, kind of took over much of the world, how were people living in ways that were sustainable, that were nurturing to their communities? Um, what are things that we can um, value and hold with us as we go into the future um, and use some of the very kind of practical tools like scenarios um, and trends, where does that kind of mindset actually tangibly show up in the work that we're doing? This is complicated with the turning off and the turning on of the microphones, but um, yeah, I'll go with your definition. I'll go with your definition, and, and I say it that way because as a, as a science fiction writer, um, I don't come at things from definitions. Like I, like I, of course, you know, I, ha I have a PhD in literature. I have a master's in literature and a master's in journalism. So of course, I know all of the definitions. But as a writer, when I'm sitting down to write something, I'm not thinking about that. I'm kind of I'm thinking more of, of I'm thinking beyond the definition. I'm thinking of the result of that definition, the result of the concept, and then I'm extrapolating, extrapolating from that, and. Um, and, and so like really when I think about the science fiction that I write and the way that I came about writing science fiction was very, um, it, it wasn't vibing off of the classics. It wasn't think, looking at classic science fiction which is very Western, um, very white and very male. It wasn't from coming at it from that point of view and, th and then kind of coming up with my own thing. It wasn't like that at all. It was more from experience. My, the, the reason why I started writing science fiction was going, I'm Nigerian-American. Both of my parents are, are Nigerian and they would take us back. And those experiences of going back to Nigeria and see, and then event, especially as I got older, seeing technology popping up in different places. And I started wanting to see those narratives being told because I noticed that they were not being told. That there was this, this, um, in science fiction, in visions of the future, and I'm kind of going off on a tangent, I told you I would do this, I can't help it. I can't help it. But um, in, in looking at, just this idea of looking at the future, those trips and, and seeing technology showing up in, in this part of the world, and then start, I started thinking about what is the future gonna be like in this part of the world, I realized that that narrative was not being told. And I realized that, like, those, that was that's something that was really important. So um, I'll stop there because I'm, I'm just going to go off on a completely different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, think, I think there's a couple of themes um, that I think about, which is uh, one that we've kind of talked about earlier, and I and what I, you know tying it to this place and and the people who are here with us today is. Uh, you know who who inhabits the future, yes. and and certainly I'm a big science fiction fan. And when I was reading it, I growing up I did not see any kind of uh, black, brown, indigenous voices. Uh, you know, certainly there is like a, a certain narrative of of progress and of space exploration, and like we were not a part of that. Um, we were, but it, it was still amazing. It was just like you're sitting as a as a bystander. So. Uh, you know the the stories you write, and and I think centering those the you know the people that are representative of our communities is really wonderful, and I think that um, in addition to that, it's it's not just the representation, but also um, the kind of cultural narrative that comes through with. Um, Put it, like having both the setting, the kind of mindset of the story, as well as the characters um, coming at it through a different framework and a, a non-Western framework. And, and the, um, the result of that, you know, the, the result of, and the necessity of needing, the, you know, needing those images, needing those, those stories, um, the, the importance of telling those stories, of, of, of showing, um, other people in the future, other people uh, creating certain things and, and, and creating certain technological advances and innovations. And and because a lot of people might think, might ask the question of why is it important to um, present a decolonized future? 
What, like, what, what difference does that make? What, what um, impact will that have? Uh, is, that even, is that even necessary? We, we have climate change. We should be focusing on, on um, issues, of, issues of the climate. Why should we have, um, why, why, is this, you know, why is this topic important? I kind of want to pose that to you. I know what my answer to that, <laughs> to that would be, but I want to know what yours is. Um, yeah, so I think it's getting at, um, you know, I think if we were to look at, you know, as any futurist would say, if you look at problems in isolation, you're, you're not going to be able to solve them in a, in a manner that's deep and lasting. So if you just look at climate change without looking at climate change impacts on health and climate change Im impacts uh, in the global south on like agricultural livelihoods and, and all of those things, um, you're, you're not going to be able to um, actually get to the root of the problem. Um, and I think that that it's interesting the ways in which it has come up in my work. Um, so one example that I'll share is, uh, you know, we do a lot of work on food and in regenerative agriculture um, and in the food sector. And we did a project uh, many years ago on the future of tea and the future of the tea industry. And it's really hard to, um, you know, there's a lot of issues in terms of market demand for tea and, and what does sustainable tea look like and, you know, organic certifications. But I think uh, at the root of it, the tea industry was built by colonialism. It's uh, predicated on a labor market that is plantation-based and stuck there and has very little uh, opportunity for growth and um, you know, uh, outside employment. So without looking at the kind of structures beneath that are the legacy of colonialism and trying to remake it and, and uh, you know, decolonize it, I don't think that, you know, the, the problems of the industry uh, could be addressed or the sustainability and climate issues, you can't really get to that. Yeah, very well said. I am, I'm in complete agreement. I think that a lot of the issues, if we're talking about climate change, a lot of those issues are directly linked to issues of um, colonization. You know, a lot of the problems have come up through those, um, through those problems, you know, um, and, and I think that, 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 um, what's the word? Um, you, and you kind of, you kind of touched on it, that everything doesn't happen in a vacuum. You know, things kind of affect, one thing affects the other. And, and I think that with this issue of, of, um, of, of colonialism and certain ideas that have branched out from that, if we don't, I, I basically feel like if we don't solve, if we don't decolonize, if we don't decolonize the future, we're gonna repeat the same mistakes. That's really the. <laughs> that's what it what it comes down to. If we if if we don't if we don't address this issue, like all of the technological advances, we can have all of those things. We can solve all of those things. We're still going to wind up in the same place again. I, I wholeheartedly agree. And there's there's a great book that I've started to read called um, uh, "Pollution Is Colonialism." Um, which I think kind of hits to that, that, you know, waste is colonialism in its way. Um, so uh, that definitely resonates. And I want to get back to the kind of storytelling piece, because I think that a lot of um, futures work, um, ultimately, uh, a, a lot of the themes that we've been having um, over the past couple of days have been around shifting mindsets and making a difference. And um, creating change and the desire for change in individuals and organizations. Um, and storytelling is such a big part of that. So um, where do you see kind of the link between storytelling um, and people kind of going out there and, and changing the way that they do things? I think that the, the stories, storytelling is something that definitely needs to be viewed as, it's not something that's just frivolous. There's a, um, aside from entertainment <laughs> and making life better. So like, I mean, we, we learned, especially during the pandemic, and this is a tangent, uh, but, but uh, we learned during the pandemic of the necessity of in entertainment 
You know, like when we were all having to stay in the same place, what did we do? We went to stories, we went to Netflix, we went to um, TV, all of that. So, so those things are important. But I think that, that storytelling, one of the things that storytelling, um, one of the powers of storytelling is accessibility, making something, making an issue accessible, making it, uh, um, bringing people into the issue, bringing people close to the issue and having them understand what that issue is. And that's something that I do a lot in the stories that I tell. Um, like one example, yeah, one example is in, in my novel Noor, for example, this is a, this one right here. This Noor was, um, it, it's very much about decolonizing the future like honestly at the at the root of the of that story it's about decolonizing the future but through storytelling so it's not like it's not me kind of talking at you it's me setting you in a story and then it, the story kind of opening up around you and then you understanding what decolonizing the future means it's set the story of nor is set in a future uh, a near future nigeria a very near future nigeria right and but one part that i want to talk about is there's this podcast in the story and it it talks about um it talks about uh it, it it's it's um directly linked to a trip that I took th to the Noor, the Noor complex, the Noor solar complex in Morocco, which is the biggest solar complex in the world, which is in Morocco, right? And, and like, so in, in this story, you have, um, and one of the biggest problems with, with solar energy is transferring it. Batteries are very expensive. And so these are, these are things that I'm obsessed, you know, I, I'm obsessed about and I'm really interested about. And, and just the fact of having the biggest uh, uh, solar array in the world being in Africa, just that concept is something that's a, that has a decolonizing concept. So there's that. So we've got renewable, um, re renewable uh, eternal energy in the Sahara Desert, and there's there's a possibility be behind that. This idea of the Sahara Desert being a place where um, where we can where some of the most renew like greatest amount of renewable energy in the world is in that part of the world. That's already a tweak in the way people are thinking. And so um, in this story, and this isn't to give too much away, but there's a girl in this story who is she's a Berber girl and she's a nomad. And this Berber girl goes on to invent, um, invent uh, wireless transfer, wireless energy transfer. So she solves that issue, right? And so, like, so this is so this is what I mean through storytelling, where you're taken through this this uh, this girl's narrative, and you're and and then you're also being presented with these. Um, these renewable energy um, solutions from an African perspective, you know, and it's, it's all very, it's all through the power of storytelling. And these are things that, like these are ideas, this could be something that was presented in a, a, a research paper, you know, it, but it doesn't hit the same. Storytelling has this way of kind of setting you in there without you really, feeling any discomfort, you kind of just settle into it, and then it all washes over you, and you come out understanding so much more. So I think that's, the, that's one of the roles. There are multiple roles. There's, storytelling also has a way of inspiring as well, but, but I think this is one of, one of the major roles of storytelling in this, on this issue. Uh, yes, I, I agree, and I think that um you know, uh, we have been, uh, thematically I've heard in a lot of the, the panels, including one that I was on, um, the, this kind of uh, topic about trends, like why are trends easier for people, um, you know, to, to digest, and is it because trends are, might have more factual, and this is the type of knowledge that we've been trained to think is the right knowledge. This is, you can't, you can't argue with the facts. Right, so this is the objective knowledge, whereas stories are subjective. They're, um, you know, they're not necessarily as rooted in the hard facts. Um, but 
you know, on the other hand, and, and, and you know, I'm, I'm just saying what I think to be our, our pervasive ideology. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, trends, decks, and factoids don't resonate with people. They, they hear them and um, they don't really change, whereas stories like really have the power to um, shape our emotions and our, our thoughts and actions. So is there kind of a connection that you see between um, the technological advancements and the, the kind of the science fact uh, and the science fiction? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's um, oh man, I had a thought right before. Oh, I just lost it, I just lost it, I just lost it. Oh. But um, yeah, there's that, that the, the connection between um, technical, technological advances and science fiction. And there's, I mean, there's a give and take between the two. There's, there's always been a give and take between the two. Uh, there, there are technological advances that we've had. The, the, um, I think it was the e-book was first written about in a science fiction story. And then, you know, and then engineers went and created the thing, you know, so there's always this back and forth. You know, I, I've, I've spoken to um, scientists at NASA for uh, various things and, and like, I just listen to them speaking and I'm like, all these stories are blooming in my mind. So, so there's that, like, I, I learn, I, I'm inspired by them. They're inspired by, um, they're inspired by science fiction writers. There's a, there's a back and forth. And I think that's, that's really necessary. I think also, and to speak to your point about not having to be factual, like that need, that need for the facts to be the facts. Like it's, it's not that science fiction writers are just writing out of their, you know, we're not just making, making stuff up. Some of us are, <laughs> some of us are just making stuff up, but, but some of us have done, you have a lot of science fiction writers that are actual engineers, you know? Um, so there, there are different types, of, there's different types of science fiction. There's hard science fiction, there's soft, there's, there's science fiction that just deals with uh, social issues and you don't see any technological anything in them. So there are different, different types, but there's, but there's always this, um, this back and forth between, like this give and take between science fiction and, and you know, technological advances, this dialogue, this conversation, and I think that that conversation is really important. I also think that, um, that imagination is a key component to all of this. It's, it's not, you know, we, if, if without imagination, I mean, like futurists, you know, futurists aren't necessarily science fiction writers, but I, I feel like we fall under the same umbrella. We're all speculating. We're all, we are all speculating and there's like, um, there's an element of creativity and imagination. Imagination is like, is like filling in those, those parts of the unknown and playing around with it and pushing things farther. If, if we don't, further, farther, further, yes, further. Um, but if we don't push, in order to push further, we need the imaginative, we need the creative aspect as well. Um, you can't, like, to, sometimes in order to invent something, you have to, like, you have to first imagine that thing and you have to first, like with science fiction, one thing that science fiction does, it crosses boundaries. It crosses those lines that, that science can't because it's not possible yet. Like science, science fiction writers, that's where we dwell. That's our, our bread and butter is the impossible. Those things that are like, that are unimaginable, that make no sense, that it would be great if they existed. Uh, science fiction writers speculate about those. We cross those lines. And sometimes I think that like our technology needs to needs those weird pushes, you know, those pushes of imagination to get to that point, to get that idea that can be applied to the real thing. You know, it's, so it's all kind of, it all works, everything works together in that way that I think is fascinating. Yes, I, and I think that we just, it's, it's sort of the same thing, but coming at it for kind of different angles and different purposes. So uh, in the futures world, you know, we would, have scenarios and we would have personas, which would be, you know, about an individual within a particular scenario with the idea that we want to um, change decision making. So we want to influence decision makers. We want to shape strategy. You know, we're sort of coming at it with these goals in mind, but to do any of those things, I do think that you need to tell a, a compelling story. And I think 
you know, going back to your earlier point about, you know, for you, decolonization is not kind of points on a page or, um, you know, the, the an analysis at that level. It's just putting that into practice through your writing. Uh, I think that that, you know, having the points on the page is useful so that people can start to put it into practice because I think that um, there's still sort of this idea of like, well, we think this is important and and sort of post-COVID, um, you know, you're hearing much more about diversity, equity, inclusion in, in various organizations, but I think there's still this sticky period that we're in where we're trying to figure out like, well, what does that mean and how do we do it um, on, a, on an organizational scale? Also, why is it important? That keeps coming up. Like, why, why is diversity important? And um, it's a difficult thing to have to answer something so obvious, <laughs> so to say, because, like, I, I just feel like, once again, we're just going to make the same mistakes. I mean, we, we, we need representation in, and this is going off subject again, but not really, not really. But um, we need representation in all areas. We need different, t different kinds of people, and this isn't just some, um, you know, liberal hippy dippy anything. It's logic. It's logic. If we're if we're going to have all of these innovations, if we're going to try to solve all of these world problems, and you're not utilizing every aspect of humanity, all the all the um, thinkers of humanity, and that can that can be people from different races, different genders, different everything. Like we all have different um, based on our points of views and our ideas our, and our experiences, we come to the table with different strengths and, and different pieces of knowledge. And so if like only a fraction of humanity is adding, you know, is contributing their knowledge, we're missing out. You know, that's like the, the broad umbrella um, way of, of, of talking about this. And, and then you, you, you apply that way, that, you apply that information to climate change. And I think it should be, become clear. But um, I just think that it's very, like the idea of decolonizing the future, um, it, it, that idea is kind of begging at issues of all of the isms you know, all of the isms, all of the, the people that are oppressed in various ways, it's, it's, begging, um, it's begging at those, those ideas uh, for solutions to those ideas in order to move into a better future. Like, hu humanity is not going to solve those things. Um, humanity isn't going to solve a lot of our issues until we address those things. Those things are important. Yeah, and I think um, getting those perspectives in from communities that have been um, thinking to the future and have been doing it um, in a way that's sustainable is really important. So a lot of um, indigenous communities, I mean, before Dubai was developed, people were living in the desert for thousands of years and they were able to sustain. And this is not to be technophobic and to say that we shouldn't have uh, technology, but just we also can't ignore that we do have, you know, ingrained sustainable ways of living that we can think about how to learn from. And there are communities today and indigenous communities that are able to continue those traditions. So I, I think that by learn by these types of learnings, we do come to the work think just with a different mindset that, you know, maybe maybe we don't need to continue to grow. Maybe, you know, um, uh, there's a um, Australian Aboriginal activist and writer Tyson Yunkaporta who talks about being a custodian of the future. So how do we, how are we good custodians of the future um, rather than necessarily, uh, you know, building and growing uh, the future? So just thinking about it from that perspective, I think, can also be uh, of, of value. Um, I'm getting a time check, but I want to, I want to give you a chance to respond before we um, start. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I'm in complete agreement with that. And one, one um, point that I wanted to make was that um, not everything old is bad or less than. You know, there are some things that are ancient that are valuable. And so it's like, I don't know, this, it comes down to everything, everything that I've said. You know, um, we have a lot to offer, and we have to be able to see that instead of just, uh, that's really distracting. But... Uh, <laughs> We just have to, um, 
uh, be able to see everything that we have to offer. Yeah. So we, we can obviously keep talking forever, um, but um, I know this is an issue that many folks in the room are also thinking about, so we'd like to spend the rest of the time in conversation with everybody. So uh, does anyone have any comments or questions? Um, why don't we just go like one, two, three for the first three? Great, thank you. Uh, yesterday at the energy panel, Geraldine Wessing of Shell made a statement that made me cringe. Uh, the statement was, we need to enable the global south to uh, become climate neutral. And what rubbed me the wrong way is Western corporations have developed a technique of driving nations and entire regions into technological dependence. Uh, and I, I, I kind of get the sense that this is ongoing, including in our community. So Sebastian Baumann, who I, you know, I really admire him, posted, you know, is due by colonizing futures. I was like, you know, futures aren't better if they're made by Rand, quite honestly. So, so that's sort of... So, so my question into the room, and, and I don't expect an answer, but, uh, but it's been bugging me and I would love to collaborate for, for a long time with, with other futurists on this. How do we get into a different state where technology dependence is not uh, the guarantor of success of corporations? Uh, I don't have an answer to that, but I would love to debate it. Yeah, that's a good... Um that's a good everything because <laughs> yeah, the, the technological dependence, I think it, it, it kind of comes down to a lot of the things I've been saying of the necessity of um, multiple perspectives. I think the more voices we have, the more it can be a conversation because, um, yeah, that idea of, of technological dependence, it just smacks of one small group kind of dictating the technology and where the technology needs to go. And every group, everyone, if, if you're gonna invent something, if you're gonna create some kind of technology, you're going to create it to benefit yourself. That's just a fact. So this is what I mean when you have like, when you have only a small group of voices that is dictating all of that, they're going to do everything to benefit themselves. And that's why we will continue to get this whole, um, technological dependency that always positions corporations in a position of power because who's behind all of it? And um, I wanna say, this doesn't sound right, but uh, you can't completely blame the corporations because they're just trying to survive and thrive, you know? So th it, it's, it's the necessity of multiple voices, multiple positions of power. It's, it's when you have uh, the power structures that are dominated by a, a small few who have an, their own agenda, that's when you have those problems. So I, I just, I don't, I don't have any solutions either, but I know that, that the solution does involve more, um, more diversity. It just keeps coming back to that. Thank you. Um, hi, first of all, thank you for this really interesting talk. But I think my question is more related to, um, so I'm part of a community, a global community called Speculative Futures. And we have a chapter here in Dubai where we get together once a month, we watch a sci-fi film, and then we discuss how connected or not it is to our idea of the future. And what I've noticed is that I don't know what your books are like, and I hope to get the opportunity really soon to read them, but generally speaking, movies or books or content about the future is very dystopian. Why is that? <laughs> and are your books like that as well? And so it goes to that. Yeah, that, that I can answer, because that's something I've been in dialogue with, this idea of dystopia. The, the answer to that is people like dystopia. Like, people love that stuff. <laughs> They love it. it it's, um, you, you make a dystopian narrative, like the latest was, um, was it Moonfall? 
Lots of people watch that. I hope the, the directors are not here, <laughs> no one involved in it, because that film was bad. It was bad. <laughs> it was bad. It was illogical. It was nonsense. And I watched it, too. I watched it, too. Um, yeah, so, like, people like um, post-apocalyptic narratives and, and apocalyptic narratives. They like seeing the world die. They like seeing everything destroyed. There's a, there's a pleasure you get out of, out of viewing that. I'm included in that. I'm obsessed with those narratives. I've written a few. Um, my, my novel, Who Fears Death, is definitely post-apocalyptic. I've, I've destroyed the world multiple times in my, in my fiction. Yes, the Book of Phoenix definitely destroyed the earth. Um, but I, I, I think that, so, so that's, that's the reason why they're popular. Um, also, narrative-wise, as, as a writer, it is definitely easier to write a post-apocalyptic narrative than like something that's more, that skews more utopian. It's easier, it's instant conflict. Stuff is happening, things are falling apart, it's bad, it's bad. So it's like, that's easy to write. It's, it's, more fun, it's, it's fun to write, it's easy to write. Um, so, so those are the answers, but yeah, I, I definitely believe that we need, um, we need balance. We need balance, we need to have, um, ut in utopian literature, to, to somewhat quote the science fiction writer Kim Stanley Robinson, utopian stories do not mean that there are no problems. It does not mean that there are no problems. So it's like, so, Utopian literature, there, there's been a, a, a spawning of utopian literature, but, but I, I feel like the necessity is there to have those because, because um, if, if we keep telling, uh, stories, okay, I'm, I'm just gonna get a little philosophical here, but like stories are, I, I feel like the stories we tell ourselves over and over and over and over again become self-fulfilling prophecies. <laughs> So if we're just telling ourselves negative, 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 we look at the future, it's negative, 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 it's bad, it's, you know, if we just keep doing that, that's what's going to happen. You see what, you see the narrative you tell yourself, you know, and it, yeah, and if you can't imagine it, if you can't imagine solutions, you can't imagine, and that's why this, this, this forum is, is amazing, because it's so positive. It's like you're seeing so many solutions to, um, to some of these, these issues, but like if, if we keep telling ourselves these negative stories, it's gonna, that's what's gonna happen. And so like I, I do, like a lot of the, the, the last post-apocalyptic thing I wrote, I think it might have been Who Fears Death, but I've always fo focused since then on not, not writing dystopias, writing a more positive future. How can we have, a, what does a more positive future look like? Because I think that's, I just think that's really important for us to see that, that narrative being told more, yeah. So uh, I'll just chime in and say um, I 100% agree. I think that uh, I'm just thinking about um, Toshi, what you had said earlier about a hero's journey, and it's really hard. It, it, a dystopian story enables a hero's journey, um, and in a way that a utopian story does not. Uh, and, and it's a lot more exciting for people to think about like a very pared down, risky crisis world than it is for them to think about a global community of decision makers coming together in collaboration and hashing things out over a, 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 a boardroom or a, a meeting room <laughs> that, that does not make for good uh, storytelling, or at least it's very challenging. But there, I do, I am heartened by, like, there are a very interesting, um, you know, I'm a fan of the writer Ian M. Banks, um, and uh, I believe that's his name, Ian Banks. And uh, those are qu quite utopian in some way, but then the conflicts are interpersonal. There's still cultural conflicts. So there is conflict. It's just sort of setting up a, a more positive um, world with the use of technology uh, than, than others. So I, I think they're out there. They're, it, but it also might be what we need at this moment in time um, based on uh, the, the number of kind of crisis that we see in the world around us. Can you hear me? Hi, uh, Nicola from South Africa. I think it's a less rhetorical response. Uh, 
I think what's quite interesting uh, in this kind of discussion is, you know, as someone that researches um, on the daily in South Africa around the realities facing uh, women and children in those spaces, I'm very hyper aware of my privilege in that position as a white female. So the majority of my work is to um, listen and give others a platform. And I think, you know, my criticism in a lot of research from around the world is it's generally from the outside looking within rather from the within speaking. And I guess it is another rhetorical question in response to yours is what are we doing as futurists to offer those voices and those uh, platforms to people that have been colonized and are fighting, you know, the sort of ramifications and ripple effect of those. I guess, what are you using your privilege for? Does that make sense? Um, I'll throw it out to the audience. Does anyone want to answer that question or have a, I mean, I can keep talking, but does anyone, have, seriously, does anyone have an, a, a um, example of their work in which they successfully brought in marginalized voices, um, diverse voices that were absent from the table. And, and I, I guess I don't mean in this sense just like multiple stakeholders on the value chain. Um, I mean uh, the actual um, people most impacted by the, the policy or the organization or, or whatever situation. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Paul Epping. Um, thank you for your, your insights. And while you were talking, I thought, can we live without being colonized? Everything around us is something colonizing. Wants you to be in that group. Sometimes their group can be autonomous, changes, but you are colonized with the ideas, with something else, power. And think about Facebook, or Meta, or Twitter, or Instagram. Forget it now. You are decolonizing. What does that mean for people? So that is a positive thing about colonizing. Can we live in a world without being colonized? And that is my last, there are two things that I still want to make. We are all here, even if you want or not, completely colonized by our GDP. Everybody here. We are slaves colonized by the GDP. Whether you like it or not, we are. Imagine a world without that. That's the last one, probably input for your new novel. Things that we are don't know that we are being colonized. Because we have AI around, so precise in figuring out what your vulnerabilities are. And we grab you. Excellent. Um, what I want to add to that is, because I did have that idea, like, was it two days, when we talked two days ago, I don't know, I don't know, but I, where um, I, I, I said, well, if we, if we do decolonize, like if we, if, you know, in social terms, if we, if we do reach decolonization, something else is going to come and, and come and colonize us. And then I said it would be AI, because <laughs> that's where we're going. Um, but I, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. But, but also, it feels a little bit like um, playing with words, playing with definitions, and, and then like, like muddling, muddling things to the point where nothing is culpable like there's there's no problem because there are issues there there are there are it, there, there is racism there are groups that are being um, oppressed by other groups like that does exist 
I mean, but like if you take the if you take the word um, colonization and decolon the words colonization and decolonization, and then you just open it up to everything, you can basically erase all the concepts. And but see, even when you do that, those problems still exist. You know, so it's like it's it can either be a matter of words or a matter of um, facing these actual issues, no matter what you call them. So it, it's I don't know. Um, I, so, but I, I definitely see what you're saying. I, I understand that, like, if we solve this problem, there will be another problem that's going to kind of take its place. We're going to have there, there's going to be something else, and and. I don't know. I, I, I definitely, when it comes to AI, I'm, I'm still in the camp of not viewing everything in a dystopian way. I refuse to do that. I understand the urge to do that. I totally get it. But I feel like that's a, another self-fulfilling prophecy, prophecy if we do that. But, um, but yeah, I think that there's the word and then there are the existence of these concepts and how they play out and how they affect pe uh, actual people's lives. Add that um, you know I think in uh, colonization refers to like a very specific period in history, um, and I think in this kind of conversation we are thinking about it in the terms of uh, predominantly white but settler colonialism going into areas taking over the resources political structure um, psychology of the people that were already there and then you know redrawing borders uh, extracting resources and, and a, a whole number of kind of actions that go with that it's a very new concept in human history it's a very short concept of uh, you know a few hundred years as opposed to many years in which there were other models um, and I think that you know, there's a lot of structural kind of issues and deep issues that go along with that. And I think bringing an intersectional lens to that is very important because not all colonies are the same, not all colonized people are the same. And so thinking about, uh, you know, power and privilege and how different identities intersect is, is definitely part of that. And, you know, racism and the legacy of, of slavery in the U.S. is a very different form and, and as well as the uh, takeover of indigenous lands and that genocide in the United States is a very different than things like the caste system in India and the inequalities perpetrated by that. But I think that all are kind of linked in this framework of um, colonization. So, I, and, and then after you, I saw Tanya's hand over there. Yeah, so just a real quick response to your, to your question about examples. So I'm working with 300 youth on the coast of Kenya, um, marginalized 30, 40 years even after the British left. So colonialism, it's just not just a period, but it has residual effects, second, third, fourth, fifth generations. Um, so it's still alive today. But ages 10 to 24, they've undergone a 12-week um, community-led, youth-led, trauma healing journey. And so what I've done in my research is assessed what is your, how has your future's consciousness increased? And it's blown away with this idea that when you unshackle the brain, when you get out of that sort of, um, you're, you're caught in this box that poverty puts you in. And, and now when they've neurobiologically understood how they think and has said, it's all right, it's not you it's the system that you're part of, their time perspective, their agency, their concern for others, their understanding of systems significantly increases. And so that's an example of, of 300 youth who now are actually their trajectory has shifted you know, significantly. So that's an example that you can, you can do it. <laughs> I've done it. Cool, thanks. Uh, thank you. Also an example of work, um, and uh, not as such with marginalized people only, but niche and marginalized 
issues. And it links very nicely, um, Nedi, and we're forever using your quotes and things when we start up the workshop. I'm from, from South Africa, sorry. Um, and so what the idea is, it links also to this dystopian and utopian and also the kind of larger geological epoch that we're going into, the Anthropocene. So things are really very dystopian and difficult. And on the African continent, we have not reached human development levels necessary yet to have a good life, no matter how much or little you're consuming. Um, so given that we need to reach these human development levels within planetary boundaries, how do you start working with those crunch issues? So the methodology we've developed and the work we've done gets people to search for, and we have these gorgeous examples from all over the African continent, and this is important because this hasn't been picked up yet. It's where does innovation happen? Where do think people think differently? Where are little pockets or seeds, pockets of the future in the present, where we can have a good life within planetary boundaries? So we've collected these seeds, and these are they're all marginal, they're all niche. These are issues or ideas or projects um, or things that activists are doing and we work actively with those. And then we go take people through a process where they imagine these seeds in their mature condition and come up with different worlds. And then from there, see how do we connect that to the future and then start having conversations about how can we let these completely different ways of thinking and doing different systems grow? What has to decline to make that happen? What has to grow to make that happen? Um, and, and that's been... And it doesn't work with utopian futures because, Alicia, your point is still so very valid. It works with complex futures, but preferred ones um, and very deeply contextual, set on the African continent and look around us and see what's innovative, what's working, where can we do it? And not necessarily all think you're going to have a smart city and then your problems are solved. Okay. I'm, I'm sensing maybe a potential resource for story ideas. <laughs> um, we had a question or a comment over here, yes. Okay. Salam alaikum. Is it still the morning time? Anyway, my name is Mohammed Al Hamadi. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just want to express my gratitude for being here with the amazing spirits around me. I can sense since yesterday how beautiful was the ambience, um, and I hope that I can add something. First of all, in terms of colonization and decolonization, I don't want to go to the political side of it. Uh, we can be uh, we can be colonized by our thoughts and emotions. On, on a personal level, I would start, as a character, as personalities. This is number one. Number two, human beings, we tend to make things hectic and problematic somehow. So I do believe, uh, as I was, I got inspired by, uh, by the gentleman there to show uh, yesterday in his uh, speech when he spoke about <laughs> how the uh, hero uh, characters moved from single uh, hero to a group of heroes facing a global system, a systematic problem, something that, like that. So I do believe us nowadays or today, we are going through the phase of changing through being decolonized somehow. We are not speaking about removing the borders of the countries or something. We are being decolonized by having unified values, a uh, set of values, I would say, globally, as global citizens. Uh, we are uh, being decolonized by agreeing on, on something that the writer can be the voice of the society, the artist can be the, uh, the, the image of a certain society, so each one of us can have a role for the few in the future, sooner or later. Um, so yeah, this is in general my, I would say my input, my thoughts about today and yesterday, uh, and hopefully one day we will all find ourselves somewhere in between good and better, not good and bad, because life has always been about good and bad, but we will be between good and better, inshallah, to the best. Uh, by unifying our voices in the future, despite where we come from, what, we, what our colors are, or how we speak and express ourselves, inshallah. I don't know if you want to respond. I know there's a, a person over here that uh, had a comment. Very interesting uh, conversations indeed. Um, I'm Simba Rashenokovedzo from Zimbabwe. 
Um, uh, mine is um, is on storytelling. You mentioned something about um, uh, story writers um, uh, uh, liking them to to futurists in the in the sense that they've got the same de denomination of imagination. So I want to to ask a question there: How effective is is is, is story writing uh, in this area of science fiction? Can you pinpoint some of the um, uh, projects which you have inspired through? through written stories, particularly in the African context. Um, have you received feedback uh, from innovators who say that uh, this, uh, through this story, through this um, uh, film, through this, we have managed to, to, to come up uh, with this um, uh, innovation or this improvement. So um, we, we are looking at the prospects of um, using this uh, method in our country because we have recently launched the Center for Future Research. Uh, we are looking at it as a method which we can use to stimulate innovation among our people. So how effective is it? Yeah, it's, uh, uh, in, terms of, in terms of African futurism, right? Like, it's still very, I, it's, it's still very new. You know, I, I will just say that it's still very new. Um, and like, and I mean new as in, it's not that, that um, the, the continent of Africa, Africa is not a country, it is a continent, uh, I just need to say that, but like, it's not that Africans have not been uh, thinking about the future and ha that they don't have stories about the future, there are, you know, there are a plethora, but in terms of novelists writing science fiction novels that are on the, on the surface, like, it's clear that it is a, a science, fiction, um, science fiction narrative, that is new. I mean, I, I honestly can say that that is new. Like, I, I'm kind of pioneering the way in a lot of in a lot of senses. So it's 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 me. It, like, literally, there's probably um, I could probably list on one hand the number of us that have like that are prominent that are prominent writers. But that is changing um, every every year. That is changing, and so so eventually we'll get there. So like I think it's too early to ask how effective is it. Has that, have, have uh, any scientists sat down and tried to um, create some of the uh, things that you have come up with? It's it's too early for that. We need to give it we need to give it a little bit of time. But that will eventually come because that is the nature of of science fiction. There are like almost the ma the majority of our our. Um, devices that we use, cell phones, um, the internet, uh, the ebook, I don't know, the submarine. I'm, 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 <laughs> there's several things that were first created in science fiction and then they were then they were um, they were made made real. So that's like that's that's the, the nature of science fiction. So that will come. It's too early at this point, but I think that um, and, and, and just because it has not happened yet, it should not be assumed that, oh, science fiction is not effective. I think that's, that's kind of shooting yourself in the foot. It's, it's storytelling is powerful. Storytelling, um, storytelling moves people. We are a storytelling, humanity, human beings are storytelling creatures. Like we, we've, we've always told ourselves stories. So it's no different when it comes to science fiction. Just give it time. Um, so, uh we're gonna go to this side. So, do, do you have your have your hand up? So one, two, and then three, four. Um. Thanks, Sonica, everyone. Um, I wonder if you could speak to like strategies for, especially like speaking truth to power, like in the moment. Um, and how do we honor things that are like ephemeral, sort of more ephemeral, like vibe? Like, like we were talking, a bunch of us were reflecting on the atmosphere here, right? And so there were some Two, certain. One. There are certain, <laughs> it's ironic. Um, there are certain things that it feels like there are, might not be space ma being made for things, talking about gender equity, talking about sort of the political sector, even of the spaces where we're in, but we're sort of, be, you know, to a certain degree, you don't want to bite the hand that feeds you in a kind of way. So, like, how do you toe the line between honoring your values and not sort of being complicit in perhaps like power structures that are at play, even as you have these conversations? Because if you don't challenge that, then you're essentially making a statement about how conversations about the future happen. And you're 
you, you see what I'm saying? So there's this like philosophical stakes at play. Um, so that's kind of the first part. And the second part is we're going to extend this conversation at a, at a community generated after party at 7 o'clock p.m. Uh, at the 25 hour hotel. So if anyone wants to talk about things they've learned, make space for other people who might have felt things from a gender standpoint, from a racial standpoint, we're making safe space and having an open mic tonight at 7 um, across the street. But I want to I hear your thoughts on that first part because I'm sure you both have perceived some of that since you've been here. Um, yeah, and can we just do a, a check because we have two minutes. Okay, all right. Uh, let's let's see where how far we can get, and any questions we don't get to, we will address uh, outside and at the after party. But I think one is creating the space, which you're clearly doing by uh, creating the space to have these conversations. I do think that it's, you know, it is it is er both urgent and uh, things will be messy as people experiment and try to figure out what works because a lot of the built infrastructure that we have, the, the, the model, the, the goals of a corporation, for example, are, are not created with those principles in mind. So I think that um, speaking truth to power is really important from all levels to kind of who's in the room, who's being represented. You know, if you feel like the vibe of an event is off, you know, like taking the action to eat, have your own event, to talk to the organizers, I think those are like totally valid. And then, you know, the role of innovation and just creating your own thing, like what could we create that's successful outside of that? And I think that, um, Nettie, your stories are like a great example of, you know, just saying like, let's just write our own stories, you know, and, and this is what they might look like. So that's a very short answer to what is a long question, sorry. Talking, so I'm just gonna leave it. Because <laughs> that'll take go the next on. One. That's a big topic. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> yep. And I, I think this is clearly a topic that I think many of us feel passionate about. So feel free to chat with us after um, or come to this after party and figure out more ways to connect.